Just a couple announcements. Um, it's good to see everybody. I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas. And uh, we do have a lot of poinsettias, but I know Dave's tired of watering them all. So please take some with you as you leave. Even if you didn't uh, uh, order them, you can, you can take some home with you. Uh, also, just a reminder that our uh, new envelopes are by the offering plates, and please pick yours up uh, on your way out after the service. And uh, I was just so happy to have a, a white Christmas as well, but it does make for some icy conditions. We did put some salt down, but we couldn't cover our whole parking lot. So uh, just be careful as you walk out to your cars. And now please join me with our call to worship. We will sing your steadfast love, O Lord. We will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. We declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You promised Mary that the world bear, that she would bear a child, one who would <clears throat> inaugurate, <laughs> and my eyes aren't that great, uh, your, your commonwealth, your realm that will have no end. You have established your realm for all generations. Join me now in singing, Came Upon a Midnight Clear, it's printed in the bulletin. Join with me in our prayer of confession. O oh God, we have been created in your image. Indeed, you have crowned us with glory and honor. 
but we have lived self-centered lives, thereby failing to reflect your glory. We have not treated others with dignity and respect. We have violated your good creation. We confess our sin, O God. Renew us and restore us to our rightful place as bearers of your image. Empower us as agents of your love and justice in all that we are and all that we do. Amen. Let us confess our sins silently. We seek the Lord's strength and presence, knowing that those who seek will find. We believe that Jesus came to save sinners. We rejoice in the truth that we are forgiven and made new, freed to live a new life in Christ. Thanks be to God. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me in our responsive reading. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. <clears throat>
there's a joke out there that um, it's Christmas and musicians are excited because it's Christmas. And they're like, oh, it's Christmas because it can get really monotonous up here. So I apologize for the monotony. However, oh, that's not <laughs> You're sounding. I, I played this for the prelude. Oh, yeah, yeah no, time. you're sounding good. We <laughs> love it. We love it. Yeah. It's great. Um, Normally, the Old Testament scriptures are uh, taken from Psalms or Isaiah. One that isn't read a lot is from 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Now on Christmas Eve, we read John 3, 17, and that's not a normal passage to read, but I thought it was pretty appropriate. But uh, so this Sunday, the first Sunday after Christmas, uh, I thought we'd read 3.16, and this is the one everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When we think about Christmas, whenever I ask my kids about Christmas, uh, they know the answer that I'm looking for. They got to sit there every Sunday. Uh, but um, so they usually start off with, it's the baby Jesus. And then they move into Santa and presents and all of that stuff. So um, this sermon is not only about God's gift, but God's presence, God's presence with us. Now, uh, there's a story that uh, I like. Uh, it's maybe you've read this book, All I Really uh, Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Uh, it's, it just had its 25th anniversary, which makes me feel a little older because I remember when it came out. And, uh, but there was one short story in it uh, that talks about a grumpy person in an office and a Christmas gift. And uh, it starts off a little negative, so don't be taken aback. Uh, it all turns around and becomes a little more positive. And speaking of gifts, I should tell you a rule. It's not my rule necessarily. It came from a very grumpy looking man at a holiday office party. A man coming down with a full blown case of Scroogeitis. He had just unwrapped his dinky little present from under the office tree. In tones of amused sorrow, he said to nobody in particular, you know, it's not true what, that what counts is the thought and not the gift. It just isn't true. My mother was pulling my leg on that one. I have collected so much gift-wrapped trash over the years from people who copped out and hurriedly bought this little plastic cheapie to give under the protective flag of good thoughts. I tell you, it is the gift that counts, or rather, people who think good thoughts give good gifts. It ought to be a rule, the brass rule of gift exchange. And he stomped off toward the garbage carrying that little gift as if it was a dead roach. Well, maybe so. It's kind of harsh judgment and, and cuts a little close for comfort, but the spirit of the season has been clear for a long time. God, who, it is said, started all this, cared enough to send the very best. Wore more on more than one occasion, and the wise men did not come bearing tacky knickknacks. Even old Santa, when he's making the list and checking it twice, the angels came bringing good news, which was not about a half-price sale. To be honest, I do know 
what I want someone to give me for Christmas. I've known since I was 40 years old. Wind up mechanical toys that make noises, go round and round and do funny things. No batteries, toys that need me to help them out from time to time, wind them up. The old fashioned painted tin ones I had as a child, that's what I want. Nobody believes me, it's what I want. Well, okay, that's close, but not quite exactly it. It's delight and simplicity that I want. Foolishness and fantasy and noise, angels and miracles and wonder and innocence and magic. That's closer to what I want. It's harder to talk about, but what I really, really want for Christmas is just this. I want to be five years old again for an hour. I want to laugh a lot and cry a lot. I want to be picked up and rocked to sleep in someone's arms, carried up to bed just once more. I know what I really want for Christmas. I want my childhood back, but nobody's going to give me that. I might give at least the memory of it to myself if I really try. I know it doesn't make sense, but since when is Christmas about making sense anyway? Christmas is about a child of long ago and far away. A Christmas is about the child of now and you and me waiting behind the door of our hearts for something wonderful to happen. A child who is impractical, unrealistic, simple-minded and vulnerable to joy. A child who does not need or want or understand gifts of socks or potholders. People who think good thoughts give good gifts, period. Well, it's a little nostalgic. It's a, you might think it's a little materialistic, but the first thing I wanna do, I wanna make this clear that good gifts are not about materialism or how much they cost. I don't think that's what he's getting at here. Good gifts are about good thoughts. I can remember uh, before I had a family, I was working with um, the Christian club at Chatham University when I was teaching there. And, uh, and just like Pete over at Cal U, who you may know, we had a uh, Christian leader at, at Chatham, and I was the advisor to that group. A lot of these young people live on a shoestring budget, but we worked together. The students at, at, uh, at Chatham had a wonderful Christian organization. They made lifelong friends, and their faith grew as they moved from young adults to adults. And we had a Christmas party and uh, she gave each and every one of us some gift, but she had, she had no money. But she knew a lot about each one of our personalities. She knew I liked books. And uh, so she gave me one of her favorite books. It was written with notes in the margins from cover to cover. There were dog-eared pages where she had marked her place. And as she handed it to me with some uncertainty, she apologized for that. But you know, that's what made that gift special. Not just that it meant something to her, but as I read it, I also got to read her thoughts. I got to read her notes. I got to see where she stopped and started again. Sometimes she read for longer periods of time. It must have been an interesting sections. And it was almost like I was having a conversation with her as I read that book. And I had already left Chatham and moved to California uh, when I read that book. And it was almost as if uh, our friendship was renewed, so I had to write her a, a letter and thank her once again for the book and, you know, but it's that, it's that thought behind the gift. We all know what it's like getting gifts from young children. They create their gifts on their own with whatever 
crafts they have about them. Sometimes my wife tells me the greatest gift is sleeping in. I can understand that. Uh, so when we hear this story, some may see a grouchy, greedy old miser, unhappy with his job, disgruntled with his life, unhappy with all that the world has dealt him, which wasn't always fair, and even unhappy with a little gift at the office. But I can see something else in this story and something else in this older man. I can see a bit of Christmas spirit, a bit of the true spirit of giving, the thought that the presents are inextricably tied to one another and, and thoughts, uh, I believe he's right. I think we, the thought and the present are both tied to love and caring. So we have love, a thought, and a gift. To say it's the thought that counts can mean completely two different things. The first meaning is a bit negative. Well, at least you thought to give me something, but this thought is rooted in nothing more than etiquette, good manners, uh, an obligation. I have to give something. There's. Uh, so many memes on Facebook about re-gifting. In fact, the two main ingredients of Christmas and giving are often lacking. Gifts need to include love and happiness. They've done scientific studies, which I thought was interesting. When I was a child, I loved receiving gifts. As a parent, as a friend, I love giving gifts. And it's not just about that life change, growing up and becoming an adult. It's about receiving and giving happiness, because that's what is at the root of gifts, love and joy. And they've done all these scientific studies and they've measured uh, body chemicals and uh, brain uh, signals and neurons firing. And what they've discovered is that first they, they measure it when somebody receives a gift. And if it's everything we expect. All of these neurons fire and our happy brain places and chemicals are produced. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that all of those same neurons fire, all of those same brain chemicals are produced when somebody gives a gift as when they receive a gift. And the, the scientists that began to measure this uh, based it all on that one phrase. It's just as good to give as it is to receive. When somebody else experiences joy, we also share in that joy. I believe when God blesses us and we experience that joy, God experiences that joy with us. When we say it's the thought that counts and it's the positive meaning of this phrase, that I think we need to tune into. The gift counts, the thought counts, the love counts. Good thoughts equal good gifts. Love equals good thoughts. And once again, we're not talking about materialism. I know that Amazon had its best year ever, but that's really not what gifts are about. The love, to love someone, is to think about them, to know them, just as it's written in the Bible. God knows each and every 
one of us. To truly know somebody. To love someone is to think about them, to consider them and their needs. Someone's greatest need might be a hug, a listening ear, a kind word. Just sitting with them, visiting them, talking on the phone with them. There's an old story I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, you know, a, a woman uh, who had wonderful long hair and uh, a man who had a pocket watch. And these were their, their prize uh, things. And man sold his pocket watch to buy a comb for her hair. And the woman cut her hair and sold it to buy a chain for his pocket watch. And they exchanged these gifts. And even though they could not use them, that thought behind the gift, that love and even sacrifice was the best Christmas ever. One of my, uh, one of the things that uh, is our greatest commodity is simply time. This is a season of rushing around and sometimes I love that time period right after Christmas. Everything slows down. Before Christmas, we're cleaning and decorating and buying gifts and getting everything prepared. But after Christmas, some people think it's kind of a, a, a letdown, a, you know, a, a, a valley. Um, and some people get depressed after Christmas because they went from a lot of energy to very little energy. But I see it a little differently. I like it when everything slows down. We might have a couple days off and I just get to sit with my friends and family and children and play with them. Play with their new gifts, their new toys, build some Legos. And, uh, and you know, when I think about one of the greatest gifts, it's time. How do we spend that time? And those few days after Christmas allow us to spend that time with the ones we love. And when we look back on our lives, yes, we remember the joy we experienced giving the gifts, but I bet we remember that quiet time, enjoying and laughing family and friends and, uh, and loved ones. So when we think about all this, how do these gifts fit in with this Christmas story? Well, there's some obvious ways. We have heard parts of this story told over the last weeks of Advent and on Christmas Eve. We read in Isaiah and 2 Samuel how the prophets told us of the coming of our Lord, all of the anticipation for generations waiting for this one gift. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We heard the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth who gave birth to John the Baptist so that he might prepare the way of our Lord. We heard the story of Mary. An angel came to her and announced the birth of a son, a Messiah. She was to be the mother. And we heard of her journey to Bethlehem, the birth in a stable. We can each imagine Jesus as he sleeps, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger filled with hay. We can picture the shepherds astonished by the angels, songs praising God and the newborn king. We see them worshiping the child, and we see later the three wise men, the magi, who bared gifts. But I don't think our tradition of gift giving began with these wise men, but rather with God's gift to us 
a gift to each of us so long ago. As we read our New Testament scripture passage, uh, we often remember seeing football games and somebody holding up a sign that simply says, John 3.16. When we read of John 3.16, it often brings our mind to the end of the Gospels, and the sacrifice made, but in reality, it's about the beginning of the Gospels. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. On Christmas Eve, we read 317, the following verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the greatest expression of love. This was the first gift, the first Christmas present, a gift of love and thought. God knew exactly what we needed. God cared to give the very best. It's the thought, it's the love behind the thought that truly counts. And perhaps not even the gift, but the presence, God's presence with us, the Holy Spirit with us. We need never feel alone again for we are loved. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, our Lord. As that often advertised slogan goes, give the gift of love. Just as God gave us this gift, we can give the same gift, the gift of love to one another. Amen. As we pray today, uh, please uh, fill out any cards that uh, you might want to share uh, a person who is in need of prayer, uh, and we will lift them up in prayer and put them on our prayer list and just place those cards in, uh, in the offering plates uh, as you leave. Uh, but let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks. We thank you for the blessings, blessings of birth of Jesus, blessings of forgiveness and salvation, the blessings of your presence and the gift of the Holy Spirit with us now, this very morning. Lord, we give you thanks for your presence with us. Allow us to feel that presence, to know that we are not alone. Be with all those who are struggling during this peaceful time. It is not easy for many. People experience a range of emotions from depression to anxiety. People are experiencing addiction. People experience health issues and struggles financially. We ask for your healing power, for your loving presence, for the peace that can only be found through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join with me now in singing our hymn, Good Christian Men Rejoice. <laughs>
know that Christ's gift to us is not only a gift of a baby in a manger, it is the gift of love. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit because God loves us. It is the gift we experience every single moment of our lives, and it is a gift that we can share with others, just as God shared with us. And now experience the love of God, experience the presence of the Holy Spirit each and every day of your life. May God's face shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.